What's up, everybody, and welcome to episode one of the Best Ball Cast presented by FTN Network. I'm your host, Tyler Lochner, and I'm going to be with you all season long with Best Ball content. Really excited about this podcast. Uh, I thought it was time to have just a Best Ball only podcast. We're not going to try to fit Best Ball in with uh, redraft leagues, with DFS, with Dynasty. This is just Best Ball, pure, simple, true. Best Ball, Best Ball has become the favorite way for so many people, myself included, to play fantasy football. And I'm already doing some 2023 drafts. Uh, Actually, I probably shouldn't say that plural. I've only done one 2023 draft so far. I will be doing plenty more. We are going to talk about that draft a little bit. But anyway, thank you for joining us for this brand new podcast from FTN. We're going to have best ball content for you all off season on ftnfantasy.com. So Stay locked in there, and that will include this podcast, so stay locked in here as well. As Russell Wilson would say, best ball country, let's ride. So tons of topics to discuss all offseason, obviously. We will discuss free agency impact, the draft impact, obviously, draft strategy. We will get to all of that. I'm sure we will dissect it very, very thoroughly uh, during the season, but I thought it would just be a simple place to start with going over what an actual draft looks like for some of these really early drafts. I just did one tonight. I finished it up. My wife was watching Ginny and Georgia on Netflix and I sat next to her and did a fantasy football draft. So pretty epic, pretty awesome that uh, underdog fantasy is already running some of these contests right now. They have two 2023 tournaments being drafted already. You can do a slow draft, eight hour pick. That's what I usually like to do, but I, Uh, I did a live draft for this one, which is a 30 second pick. There are two contests right now. There's one called the big board, which is a $10 entry fee. That is a $1 million prize pool, which is so awesome to see such a huge prize pool for a draft happening in February. I mean, the Super Bowl just ended 200,000 to first in that one. And then there's another one called the little board. It's a $3 entry, very similar structure, uh, structure for 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 prizes but only a three dollar entry fee for that one about nineteen thousand entrants for that one fifty thousand to first place or sorry fifty thousand in total prizes ten thousand to first place you can use promo code ftn to sign up on underdog and you get a hundred dollar bonus credit if you donate up to a hundred dollars so it's a pretty incredible deal you can also check out the latest underdog adp on ftnfantasy.com or just you know just google underdog ADP. You'll see FTN fantasy on the top. So check that out. And like I said, tons of underdog and DraftKings and other best ball content will be on FTN fantasy. And I actually think a fair amount of it might be free this off season too. So definitely check that out. Anyway, let's jump into what this draft looked like for me. I was drafting from the 1.04 spot and I was kind of hoping Christian McCaffrey would follow me because I am still in love with with CMC, but he did go second overall. So that draft started Justin Jefferson, who right now seems like the consensus 101. Kind of hard to argue after the year that Jefferson had. And also pretty easy to argue that he hasn't necessarily reached his peak. I think we could see his peak over the next two seasons. So Jefferson, pretty safe pick at 101. And then CMC went, Jamar Chase went, and then I had the the 104 pick, and I had my choice between Cooper Cup, Tyreek Hill, Travis Kelsey, Austin Eckler were all on the board. And I went with Cooper Cup. Uh, Cup was the MVP in fantasy in 2021. Throughout the first eight games of 2022, prior to his injury, he was the number one fantasy football player in 2022 as well. This is based off the FTN fantasy fantasy wins added stat, which just straight up measures how many wins a player contributes to your fantasy team. So pretty high praise for cup to have been number one in that category, far and away number one for what it's worth in 2021. And he was on track to do it again in 2022. Obviously he was hurt. Uh, He should be back for 2023. Matthew Stafford should be back and probably throwing to Cooper Cup way too much uh, for real football purposes, but for fantasy football purposes, we'll take it. We'll take it. Um, I think Cup is is still a safe pick in that first round there. Here's how the rest of that first round went. So after I took Cup at 104, Tyreek Hill went at 105, Travis Kelsey at 106, Jonathan Taylor, Austin Eckler, and then this was very interesting. Josh Allen at 109, Patrick Mahomes at 110, 
and then Steph Diggs and Devontae Adams to round it out. That Devontae Adams at, at 1.12 will look pretty good if Aaron Rodgers ends up playing with the Raiders, I think. But the real surprises there were Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes both going in the first round. I'm not sure, honestly. And then Jalen Hurts actually went at the 202 spot. So I'm honestly, I'm not sure if that's... It, it surprises me that they went in the first round, but... I do actually think we're going to see quarterbacks go higher this year. Um, I don't think this was just an anomaly in this draft that I did. I think that we will see quarterbacks go higher. I think that it actually might be right for quarterbacks to go higher. I'm not saying you should draft a quarterback in the first round. I do think that this is an incorrect move uh, by by these two drafters in particular, but I do think we're going to see them go earlier. Uh, the fantasy wins added stat at FTN Fantasy really showed how valuable top end quarterbacks really are for your fantasy team. I think that in the past, the late round quarterback strategy was very popular and for good reason, but there's just such a difference between these top end quarterbacks and then a, a, just a pretty significant teardrop right after the top. And in terms of how much value they bring to your fantasy team, it is significant. So I do think that they are worth more draft capital than we've given them in the past. Again, not first round draft capital, but more. I will probably talk about this more in another episode. I I need to do some more research on it. I'm planning an article on it this off season as well. So stay tuned for that. But yeah, that's how that first round went. And in the second round on my pick, I went with Amon Ross St. Brown. So started my draft with Cooper Cup and Amon Ross St. Brown. I kind of wanted Jalen Waddell or Saquon Barkley or Brees Hall, but those were the three guys that were picked right before me. So I went with Amon Ra and I'm not mad about it at all. So he's just a really good player. He was third in Yak in 2022 behind Jefferson and AJ Brown. He had 106 receptions, which was fifth. Uh, that's despite him missing a game and he he was dinged up in other games. Um, I, I know he missed at least half a game with a with a with a suspected concussion. The yardage with with Amon Ra St. Brown is not top top flight like like Jefferson or Devontae Adams or Steph Diggs. But uh, it's certainly a very solid fantasy wide receiver too for my team drafting in the second round there. I think you can be happy with Amon Ra as your wide receiver one um, this year as well. But again, I started Cooper Cup. In the third round, coming back to me, I drafted Travis Etienne. Happy with him as my tail end, with as a tail end RB1, as my RB1 for this squad. Uh, especially after taking Cup and Amon Ra in the first two rounds, I knew that I should probably draft a running back. The debate really there was Josh Jacobs versus ETN. And I think if 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 these ADPs stay similar, this is a this is probably a choice that people are going to have to make in the middle of the third round. And obviously if you're doing a lot of drafts, uh you'll probably just diversify and you'll make sure you've got a little bit of both of them. But but that middle of the third round has ETN, Josh Jacobs, and Ramondre Stevenson, who who's also in that mix. So these are players that that were good in 2022. Josh Jacobs was obviously spectacular in 2022. Ramondre Stevenson was spectacular, uh, not as high level as Josh Josh Jacobs, maybe not quite as consistent. And then ETN didn't catch as many passes as people thought he was going to catch, but was hyper, hyper efficient rushing the ball. Really not hard to see him having a bigger, an even bigger role next year with the Jaguars on an ascending team, an ascending offense. So yeah, if you're doing multiple drafts, you're, you're going to diversify between these three. I chose ETN over Jacobs and Ramondre. Again, hoping that um, I just think the Jaguars offense is going to be better than the Raiders and the Patriots. So but pick your poison with, with any of those three, though. I don't think you can really go wrong. So anyway, I went ETN. Uh, and like I said, Josh Jacobs and Ramondre were the only other running backs drafted in the third round. In the fourth round, uh, Tony Pollard and Alvin Kamara were the uh, top two running backs who came off the board. I ended up taking Justin Herbert. By the end of the draft, I ended up regretting this. Um, I was planning on taking Herbert and maybe stacking him with uh, with Keenan Allen. Although I know Keenan Allen might might be uh, he might be released from the Chargers. I he's still very productive. I think the Chargers might maybe ask him to take a pay cut. But anyway. For the purposes of this draft, I took Herbert. I didn't stack him with anybody. Huge fail on my part, but you know what? It happens sometimes. 
and in the fifth round, I took Joe Mixon. So this one was this one's really interesting. I, honestly, I'm not 100 percent sure why he's going in round five. He was a top 12 running back last year. Of the top 15 running backs, he was the only one who played fewer than 16 games. I think this is just a case of the late season slump that Mixon had. He didn't have any touchdowns after the bye until he scored one in week 18, but fantasy fantasy games were over by then. So for fantasy purposes, <clears throat> he had his bye week in week nine and didn't score any touchdowns after that. And it was disappointing because the game right before his bye was when he scored four touchdowns and scored 56 or whatever fantasy points and was just the best fantasy performance of the entire season by any player, not just Mixon. I also think that the fact that uh, Perrine was getting more in on third downs, even in the playoffs, he was really almost exclusively the third down running back. But in any event, Mixon is a starting running back on a very elite offense, good for 15 to 20 touches. And uh, yeah, I'll gladly take him as my fantasy RB2 in round five. I really think that in these early drafts, Mixon is one of the better values at the running back position, especially, especially if you start like I did in this draft with, uh, with, with back-to-back wide receivers, or maybe you draft Travis Kelsey in a wide receiver, but yeah, Mixon is a, is a, is a good zero RB target. Uh, if you're not going super aggressive on zero RB and, and me and selecting them maybe in the middle rounds. So after Mixon in round five, I then went wide receiver, wide receiver, wide receiver in round six, seven, and eight. I took Mike Evans in round six. I took Brandon Ayuk in round seven, and then I took Traylon Burks in round eight. Round six was interesting. I took Evans at the end of a a pretty aggressive run on wide receivers. This is this is how round uh, six played out in the draft. Kyle Pitts at six oh one. God rest the soul of that person who who took Kyle Pitts, Isaiah Pacheco at six oh two, and then Keenan Allen, who actually who is actually who I wanted because I had Justin Herbert, but obviously I waited too long to draft him. Anyway, Keenan Allen started off a run on wide receivers. This is in the middle of round six. Keenan Allen, Terry McLaurin, Jerry Judy, Hollywood Brown, DJ Moore, Jamison Williams, and then I took Mike Evans. So, yeah, the the well kind of runs up pretty dry there. This is like the end of the wide receiver twos. Maybe you're starting to look at the wide receiver three territory. Uh, not necessarily, you know, I think some of these players can perform as wide receiver ones. Honestly, DJ Moore, McLaurin, Keenan Allen, obviously Mike Evans, if he gets into the end zone more next year, but that's just where they're being drafted right now. So that middle of the sixth, that sixth round, uh, at least in this draft, uh, yeah, you look for a lot of wide receivers to come off the board. So, um, <clears throat> if you need one plenty to pick from there after that, there was a little run on non-wide receivers, not surprisingly, Aaron Jones, JK Dobbins, Miles Sanders, Dak Prescott, Tyler Algier all went off the board. I followed it up with Brandon Ayuk. Uh, it was for me, it was between Ayuk and Pickens. And I think that it's tough. I think this is again, one of those things where if you're doing multiple drafts, you're going to end up with exposure to all of them. And actually some other wide receivers on the board around there were um, some rookies, Quentin Johnson and Jordan Addison were there. Uh, Gabe Davis was also there. Not super interested in him. It's funny to see Gabe Davis, who was a third round pick last year down in the seventh round this year, despite his situation basically being the exact same. Um, so. Yeah, I I took Ayuk again. This is a situation where if I'm just doing a single draft, I'm drafting the player who's on the better offense in the better situation. I do think that you can pretty easily make the case, though, that Pickens is the better player and maybe has higher upside because he'll be entering year two. So maybe I made a mistake with that one, but it is what it is when you're drafting with 30 seconds on the clock. You got to make the quick decisions. And then in round eight, I took Traylon Burks. So Maybe this was a little bit of a case of me saying, oh, maybe I should have taken Pickens, the the year two wide receiver. So then I drafted the year two wide receiver in Traylon Burks. And it looks like after I drafted Burks, there was a a cliff, I think, in wide receivers. And I think it's uh, maybe makes me a little nervous. Maybe I drafted a player in between the cliff. Maybe I should have waited. But after I took Burks, 
there was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine straight picks without a wide receiver. Uh, the next wide receiver who was taken was Juju. Um, so yeah, there, there's a, there's a cliff there after that run in round six, and then a handful more wide receivers in round seven, it looks like round eight to nine is where people stop drafting wide receivers. So just be aware of that gap. Be aware of that gap there. If you are looking for wide receivers, you're going to want to make sure you have probably your starting stable on the books by the end of round seven. Um, probably sooner than that, honestly. Uh, but round seven after that, it really does seem like that's where it starts to get a little dry. Round eight, again, is where the final cliff is. After that, I drafted, who did I draft? Round nine, I took uh, I took Jamal Williams, who will, is a free agent. He really wants to be back with the Lions. Uh, I don't really see a great reason why the Lions would not want him back. I, I took him at pick 100 in round nine. Felt pretty good for the player who just scored 17 rushing touchdowns, led the NFL, set a franchise record for the Lions, which is saying something considering the running backs the Lions have had. Barry Sanders, on Johnson, you know, some really elite legendary players. Jamal Williams stands above them, though, with the 17 rushing touchdowns. He also had over 1,000 a, a rushing yards, which honestly, I didn't even know until I was checking out his stats. I, I thought it was just the touchdowns, but yards, that's pretty solid yardage, too, for a guy who was coming in at the goal line. Anyway, yeah, there's the risk that he goes to another team, isn't utilized the same way, but he really wants to be with the Lions. And if they have the space for him, like that offense was was cooking and Williams was a big reason why. So I do expect to see him back. I expect to see him in a very similar role. And if that's the case, then round nine is just a, is a complete steal. He's not going to score 17 rushing touchdowns again, but even if you cut that in half, round nine is still a good a good spot to draft him. So happy with that pick. So at, after nine rounds, I did not have a, a tight end and that was not by design. I actually, when I drafted Justin Herbert in round four, I wanted a tight end, but the four picks right before me were TJ Hawkinson, Mark Andrews, Calvin Ridley, and George Kittle. So I was going to draft any one of Hawkinson, Andrews, or Kittle. I ended up going with Herbert instead. I did not want, uh, I did not want Kyle Pitts. I didn't want Darren Waller. And then after that, I was just like, okay, I guess I'm waiting at the tight end position. So uh, personally, I like to, I like to draft one of the elite tight ends. I also missed out on Evan Ingram and Dalton Schultz, um, who I think are in that kind of middle tier who I like to draft. They're going several rounds after like Dallas Goddard, even Kyle Pitts. Um, I like where they're currently going. So I waited a little bit longer, but I did not want to be completely left in the dry. So I went tight end back to back. I went Pat Fryermuth and I went Dawson Knox. What I like about those picks is Knox obviously has the multiple touchdown upside playing with Josh Allen. Fryermuth uh, has a solid floor and is still a young player um, who is just the, the complete safety blanket for Kenny Pickett. Not amazing, but considering I waited until round 10 to draft my first tight end, I knew that I needed to go back to back to not just be a complete, hopefully not a complete flop at that position. Round 12 at the 1209 spot, I took Alexander Madison. This feels like a really good price for him at the moment. So Madison is going to be a free agent. And that obviously means that he could be the lead back somewhere. And as we've seen from Madison, he's got the three down chops. He can catch, he can run. He's got a nose for the end zone. Alexander Madison as a starting running back somewhere would be, I mean, honestly, could be a fantasy RB1. So I'm drafting him in the 12th round. Absolutely no problem drafting him there. I mean, that is, I think off the top of my head, I think that's even a little cheaper than he was going into drafts last year when he was just a, a very valuable handcuff. And so I think worst case scenario, he lands on a team and he's the backup running back. Like he's not going to be a third stringer somewhere. He's going to be at worst. He's going to be a second stringer and we could even see. So I think, Al I think Madison's range of outcomes are massive, right? He's got top 10 upside. I also think he has, 
Um, I think he could kind of be like a Jamal Williams type player on a team where they utilize him heavily near the end zone. Um, or he, worst case scenario, he's just a handcuff again, at which point he's a very elite handcuff and you're not paying any more for him, at least in these early drafts than you were last year. So Madison feels like an extremely good pick for me in the 12th round. Really, really like him there. I mean, the other, the other players going around him are Leonard Fournette, uh, Greg Dulcic, Greg Dulcic, Michael Gallup. I love Michael Gallup, so I probably shouldn't have mentioned him there because I really do love Michael Gallup. But Wandale Robinson, I, I don't know. I like I like Madison there more than all of them. And then I took Jarek McKinnon in round 13. Uh, yeah, I, I like that pick too. So now we're getting, and honestly, now we're getting into the later rounds and I don't think it's quite as interesting in these later rounds. I will say because I waited so long at the tight end position, I drafted another tight end. I did not just leave myself with Fryermuth and Dawson Knox. I drafted Trey McBride in the 16th round. Uh, Richie James in the 17th, he started to break out towards the end of the year. I drafted Mac Jones as my backup quarterback, whatever. Um, he, he'll be fine. Uh, Herbert should outscore him pretty much every single week. Uh, and then I drafted Mecole Hardman in round 15 because apparently I just can't quit Mecole Hardman. No matter how hard I try, I can't do it. Uh, Kadarius Tony's there. Guess what? I don't care. I'm still drafting Hardman. So I don't know, we'll see. I don't know. I, I, I hope that his ADP rises because if it doesn't, I'm going to be, I might have like a hundred percent Hardman and I don't think I can emotionally handle having that much Hardman. So, uh, if you're listening, please go out there. Please draft Hardman earlier so that his ADP rises and I don't have to continue to feel like I have to draft him. Let's see. Oh, one other note. I swear these were 18 round drafts last year. I did a lot of underdog drafts last year. They were 18 rounders. So when the 18th round of this draft ended, I was like, all right, cool. I'm done. I closed it up. I looked back 15 minutes later and uh, these drafts are 20 rounds. So Shout out to reading the rules before you do the draft, which is not something that I did, obviously should have done. So my final two picks were auto drafts, Will Levis and Robert Tunyon. Not what I would have done, but it is what it is. That's what happens when you don't read the rules. So the final roster construction was three quarterbacks, five running backs, eight wide receivers, and four tight ends. If I was paying attention in the last two rounds, I probably would have gone with either two or three quarterbacks. I would have gone with six running backs, either eight, or I would have gone with nine wide receivers, and I would have gone with three tight ends. I would not have drafted a fourth tight end. I would have been happy with Firemuth, Knox, and McBride. Anyway, that's the <clears throat> that's how my mock. That's not, not a mock. I gotta. I, I can't say that. I'm used to saying mock in the off season, but this was not a mock draft. That is how my first official draft of the 2023 fantasy football season went. That is going to take some time getting used to saying. And I think just to wrap it up, I'm just going to just point out some other things that I thought were interesting from some things that other players did in the draft. Uh, Brees Hall went at the 206 spot. Brees Hall was a not like elite elite, like Austin Eckler elite fantasy running back, but he was a top 10 fantasy running back. I think he very quickly goes back to being a top 10 fantasy running back. If you are concerned about drafting Brees Hall in the middle of the second round, I would not be. I think by the time the summer rolls around and if he's training in training camp or maybe he's playing some in the preseason, I think his ADP is going to go to the end of the first round. I really do. Javante Williams was drafted at the 507 spot. Uh, this is a player who was being drafted at the end of the second round. Uh, I really honestly, anywhere in the second round last year, despite Melvin Gordon still being there, Melvin Gordon's obviously gone. Javante Williams is coming back from an ACL tear. Scary. Sure. But the, the fifth round, I mean, come on, I, that's, that's going to rise. So in these early drafts, I think Williams in the fifth is a good pick. Kind of like Mixon in the fifth as well. Kyle Pitts. I, I mentioned this earlier. Kyle Pitts went at the 601 spot. Still pretty high, honestly, for a player who was just so horrendously bad for fantasy uh, as a third round pick last year. So dropped by three rounds. 
the talent is such a draw. So it's, you can't be like, Oh, you know, you're such an idiot for drafting Kyle Pitts because I mean, the dude's really freaking good at football. It just wasn't there in 2022. It's so hard to see that just continuing to not be there, but certainly takes some cojones to press draft on Kyle Pitts in the sixth round. Jamison Williams also went in the sixth round, hardly played in 2022, but he was just electric when he did play. I mean, he caught a a deep touchdown on his first catch. He had another deep touchdown that was called back from penalty. Um, Yeah, the Lions offense is going to be one that you want some fantasy exposure to again in 2023, maybe even more so than in 2022. Williams should be a part of that. And then Cam Akers went at 708. I don't really have anything amazing to say about Cam Akers right now. Any great insight. I think that there's very high potential that the Rams do something different at running back, whether that be through free agency. We talked about Alexander Madison, maybe Madison ends up going there, but on, uh, on the flip side, Akers was good. I mean, he was like the best bright spot on the Rams offense down the stretch. So who knows? It's a, it's a mystery box with Cam Akers. The seventh round feels right that the good thing about drafting him there is that the payoff is potentially huge. Like you could have a fantasy RB two in the seventh round. You could also have a player who's not on a roster though. So that's what happens with these early drafts. It's there's a lot of just guessing as to what's going to happen because so much changes. Yes, we're in the off season, but so much changes free agency, the draft training camp, camp battles. Um, Rookies, second year players becoming better, teams being traded, players like Jamal Williams having breakout seasons. Like so much is on so much is on the table. Um, and we're really just doing the best we can with the information that we have. And that is just a look at how a very, very early 2023 fantasy football underdog best ball draft went. And I think that's gonna wrap it up for oh, actually, I was gonna say one more thing. I was talking about rookies and how everything's kind of a mystery box the rookies are a mystery box in in these early best ball drafts as well uh Bijan robinson went at 203 in the draft that i did i'm not saying that's right or wrong it's just it's early for a player that doesn't even have a team yet uh that could look like a steal if he lands in a really great situation um and that's part of the draw of doing these super early drafts is that you can you can get players well 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 below where they're going to end up going in later drafts so hop in try a draft check out underdog fantasy with code ftn you will get a deposit bonus of up to a hundred dollars if you do that so get some get some games in on us and you can find me in the lobbies there at lochner nfl that's the same as my twitter handle hit me up Thank you for listening to the first episode of the Best Ball Cast presented by FTN Network, and we will see you next time.